Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us from many countries today. My name is Kim, I'm with the AIMS team and I'll be your host for today. Today's webinar is about top five barriers to supply chain network design adoption and how to overcome them. Presented by Brian Dooley and Paul van Europe. Brian is a demand-driven thought leader and has spent more than 25 years in supply chain operations. Prior to joining Ames, he was head of supply chain design at British Telecom. Paul has as well more than two decades of experience in supply chain planning solutions, leading many successful implementations for global clients. He is an expert in network design and optimization. Now, without further ado, I hope you will enjoy the webinar and let's turn over to Brian. Okay, thanks, Kim. Good morning, good afternoon, uh, wherever you are in the world. So we're going to split this webinar uh, into two sections. Um, so a really, a really complex agenda. Um, and I guess simplicity is going to be a, a theme that we want to draw out during, uh, during the webinar, really. So for the first half, will be me um, and I'm going to take you through uh, some research findings from two sources of research um, have a look at what we learned what that told us what the challenges are around network design and what the what the benefits are that can be had uh, and then from that Paul will take over and, and work through an example using our SC Navigator product and um, to kind of bring to life how you can address some of those challenges and really get to uh, get to the benefits and unlock the value in in network design so that's that's the plan for the next uh, about 40 minutes and we'll leave we'll leave kind of five minutes at the end for questions and and feel free to type questions in during the webinar um, we'll we'll get to as many as we can at the end <coughs> so in terms of the two research stu studies so the first one was one that we did uh, in conjunction with Laura Ciceri's Supply Chain Insights organization um, so this was back in 2017 there was 110 respondents in total uh, across a range of manufacturers retailers uh, wholesalers distributors some 3PLs as well um, and, and then following on from that, because that, that gave us some, some really great insights, but also asked some further questions. We conducted our own survey as well late, uh, late last year with, with 73 respondents on it. So, you know, across the two surveys, getting close to 200 uh, respondents. So quite a good, um, a good spread there in terms of getting a real feel for what people are doing with network design, how they're approaching it, what they see the barriers are, the potential benefits, the technologies that they're they're using. And and we we do this kind of research at AIMS because we want to understand what the market wants out there, what challenges it's it's experiencing, what do supply chain professionals really want to be able to do with, with technology so that we can Take that on board and, and bring that uh, bring that into our product. So let's um, let's kind of dive into into what we found. Um, so firstly, from the supply chain insights survey, and, and and that started by looking at who's actually doing network design, and 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 of those that are doing it, how effective is it? And you can see from the pie chart on the left there that that fifty percent of the of the of the people surveyed are doing network design and using some sort of technology to support it an additional 22 percent are doing network design but not really using any technology uh, to support it so so 72 percent um, so, so you know most organizations are are doing some form of network design and, and i guess what's interesting when you look at the chart on the right hand side then is Although most organizations are are doing some form of network design, actually how effective that is 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 not that great with only nineteen percent considering it's a very effective process um, and and when we start to look at what are the challenges that that people are experiencing in terms of why it's not an effective process, then kind of the top two that come out straight away are around data quality and and the skilled resources um, and, and this is something that we 
we come across time and time again and we're, we'll, we'll explore further in the survey and, and will certainly be something that Paul uh, Paul draws on when he does the does the demonstration. I think some other interesting ones in there around having the right tools and software, how long it takes to execute this and, and also upper management support as well, um, which again is something we'll we'll come on to. So kind of drilling down into those into those challenges in a bit more detail. Um, if we start on with the right hand chart, so what that's looking at is is those that don't have any network uh, design process right now. What's what's really stopping them from doing that? And and the top one that comes out there is is lack of skilled resources. Um, and and our our kind of experience from talking to people is this op often is a a, more a perception that you need highly skilled resources to be able to use the technology that's available out there to do network design rather than necessarily um, a reality and and the second one there is the is the lack of upper management support so often there's a there's a, a desire and a want to to do this but they can't get the sponsorship of the of the senior team and poor data quality is still uh, in in the top three um, and, and again, our experience here is this is a, another perception issue around what level of quality you need in the data to be able to get to get started. And, it, and if we contrast that with those who are actually doing network design already, that then here data quality is right at the top of the list. And here our experience is, is, is kind of two things. So depending on the technology being used then it, it it can require it can be very data hungry right from the word go and and that creates this this issue around having all of the data um right at the start but but, but again there's a there's a perception there that almost to get an accurate result i must first spend lots and lots of time uh, getting very very high quality data which is not necessarily the case and that's something that paul is Paul is going to take us through. Interestingly, I think to, to contrast to the right hand chart, right tools and software now jumps up the list. So it's almost those that don't have a design process kind of believe that, yeah, well, if I just get the right software, it's going to work. Actually, those that do have one, once they've got the technology, they're not necessarily seeing the benefits from it that they were expecting. So, so if we drop now into, into the results from um, our own survey so what we wanted to do here was really really dig into a bit more detail um, behind some of those those challenges and, and barriers and look at well, what specific technologies are people using what frequency do they do this so, so the first chart there and, and it's 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 probably no surprise to a lot of people on the call and, and it may be uh, of some comfort to some of you but spreadsheets are are still the number one uh tool deployed for for network uh network design closely followed by kind of a combination of previous experience and gut feel and i, and I guess that's the the 20 odd percent that said they do network design but don't use any any real technology to to support it and that probably flows into the second chart then which is is what the typical <clears throat> The typical use for network design and and this is something we really want to sort of draw out in the demonstration so so again the the, the prevalence here is it's used very much on a project basis uh, very periodically to answer big specific questions you know where do i build a new distribution center how do i radically change my network footprint and and not many organizations are using it for more tactical planning on a monthly basis and, and also as part of just their ongoing decision support. And again, this is something we'll we'll look at in the in the demonstration. So if we now look at frequency and speed, and I guess part of this won't be a surprise given what's on the the previous slides. So again, we asked, you know, how often do you look at your network for improvements? Um, so again here it's it's either in multiples of years or or annually some are doing it quarterly but but very few at at a monthly frequency and only a handful doing it it weekly i think weekly is an interesting one and 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 again probably part of the reason for that is when we then asked well okay how long does it take to get answers to the questions that you're you're asking as part of your your network design and and here 
weeks is the norm, a, an awful lot in months, a lot in days, but very, very few are, are able to get answers, answers within hours, which again, probably is, is why these things are just big projects done to, to not a huge amount of, uh, of, of frequency. So, so the last uh, the, the last kind of question we asked in our in our research was around what's the ideal um, scenario? What what's the benefit you would expect to be able to get from a a well executed network design process? And and I guess there's a couple of interesting things here. Um, cost savings is not at the top of the list, so this is not purely about saving costs, but 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 actually what most of those survey respondents wanted to be able to do was to get better decision making probably <laughs> enabled through more transparency across the network but but the key one really was they wanted to become a lot less reactive and more proactive around their network decision making so this is around simulations and evaluating scenarios and, and looking at opportunities in the network um, and that's so that's what people want to be able to do but can't necessarily do um, with the, their approaches that they have right now. So kind of wrapping all that up before I, I transfer over to uh, over to Paul. Um, so, so kind of what we what we saw from both both surveys really, and it, and it's kind of our experience when we when we speak to people as well, is is most people are doing some sort of network design, but they're they're frustrated because they feel it's it's ineffective. It takes too long both to to execute the model and, and to get answers. And quite often the tools and the software that they've got are, are a barrier to to that process. The, the other issues that that surface as well is is this dependency on skilled resource and, and poor data quality. And, and as I suggested earlier, our, our argument there is that that sometimes is a is a perception of a challenge rather than a reality dependent on how you approach it and that's something Paul's going to going to focus on and then the lack of senior management support so we want to do this but we can't enable that change process because we can't get the sponsorship uh, from the senior team and again the kind of how long it takes to get to answers and, and all of those challenges become a, a sort of self-fulfilling prophecy on that one and, and and really what people want to be able to do with network design is is improve their decision making get greater visibility insight into their their network not just on a annual basis but a, you know a, 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 at a much more frequent uh, monthly weekly level and and really be able to start doing some proactive analysis looking at scenarios looking at what if simulations to, to make assessments on the network um, you know on a much more much more routine uh, routine basis so so with with that and with that positioning of what the the analysis and the the surveys found i'm going to hand over to paul who is is going to using our our sc navigator product is kind of bring to life some of those points and and demonstrate hopefully demonstrate uh, how you can address those and how some of them actually aren't necessarily a, a real challenge so I'll I'll shut up and <coughs> over to you, Paul. All right, thanks for that. Uh, thanks, Brian. So yeah, we're going to take a look at at um, a demo that we've created in uh, in the AC Navigator uh, technology, the AMS AC Navigator technology, which is basically a platform of of apps that we've we've created to deal with some of these 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 problems. And the app that we're looking at right now is the Network Design application. And it's all uh, browser-based, so so uh, really easy to use, and uh, it will be a theme that we'll, we'll touch on a few times is the is the ease, ease, ease of use of this uh, of this uh, technology. But basically, what we're looking at is a supply chain for uh, for Spain. It's a, a model of two products, so you could think of a, a retailer selling general food products and uh, general merchandise, but it could really represent any uh, retail supply chain. And then the way we've constructed is, is the, 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 the results panel. So the one where the, the analyst or the supply chain professional is, is, is gaining these insights is made up of a top and a bottom. So in the bottom, we've, we've run a scenario uh, and we'll call it the base case. So typically what you want to do with, with network design is just really run multiple scenarios and run a lot of different test cases uh, to help you understand your network better and to gain those, those insights. It's really it's really a scenario analysis tool. So we've put a reference case at the bottom, 
and then we'll run a couple of scenarios and show you the results in the in the top uh, the top uh, panel over here. So just to give you a quick uh, summary of 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 the the costs over here on the right. So we've got a an end-to-end -end supply chain cost, um, and we break that down into uh, resources, which is our generic term for for DCs. So you've got a resource fixed and a resource variable cost. And then you've got secondary transport cost, which is then the cost of outboard, outbound transport from the from the DC to the to, to the customer. But so we created a fairly simple uh, simple demo here. You can you can model all the way back to supply. So you can model suppliers. You can model production resources. Uh, you can model the primary transport from supply to to DC. Uh, you can model multi echelon uh, transport from DC to cross stock, for example, and direct transport. So what we're seeing is just a subset of the of the of the end-to-end -end supply chain for this uh, for this example. Alrighty, so let's uh, imagine we're the supply chain leader of this uh, supply chain, and we want to try and uh, run a few uh, uh, scenarios to get some insights. Um, and you may have a gut feel that you know you've got too many uh, DCs in your in your network. Maybe my competitors are doing it with uh, with less. So I want to run a scenario where I test that. So <clears throat> the page that we're looking at right now is the is the control panel, and the way this works is you set your different um, <clears throat> you set your different um, uh, uh, parameters that you want to run for a scenario um, in this in this panel over here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change this to a number one, <clears throat> the minimum number of DCs, um, and I'm going to hit the optimize button over on the bottom uh, right over here. So what's happening right now, <clears throat> as it as the model solves, is that it's it it takes the the, the data that we've uploaded as the supply chain network, um, and configures that as a mixed integer program. Um, so the, the the open close decision for the the DCs is the integer bit, and it passes that to a CPLEX solver which lives lives up on the cloud, and then that uh, solver will come back with the the optimal answer. And that will then come back and render in the in the browser for us to uh, uh, to look at. So straight away, I can see over here it's it's close to DCs, Segovia and Toledo. So let's go and take a look how that looks in the uh, uh, in the results screen. <coughs> All right, so yeah, in the I'm just going to take off this so that the dots are red instead of uh, blue. Um, so these red dots are the are the DCs in the network. You can see what the model's done is in the base case it had a, a DC in the middle of Madrid, and it had one in the north in Segovia and one in the south in Toledo. So what the model is saying, you know, that's that's a waste. These three DCs are too close together. I'm going to close those two because what it means is that I can save some money in fixed costs. So look at the the, the DC fixed cost at the bottom was 9.4 million, and at the top it's 7.3 million. So I'm saving DC fixed costs, but I am incurring a little bit more in secondary distribution cost. So secondary distribution goes up from 34.4 million to 35.3 uh, million. So what it's doing is taking the end-to-end -end supply chain costs and always trying to minimize those costs and come back with, uh, uh, with, an, with an optimal uh, uh, answer. So let's take a look at what this means for capacity in the in the in the network. So I'm going to go to the screen which summarizes the the, the capacity usage at the different DCs in the in the network. So you can see the black dots on the map are the DCs that it's closed, and then the ones with the yellow dots are the DCs where uh, the, the the throughput is equal to the the capacity, and those are shown as the the yellow bars on the on the graph as well. So you can see that what the model's saying is, you know, these three uh, DCs, so Sevilla, Valencia, and this one over here, um, are running at capacity. Well, I got a little bit of spare capacity at Alcobendas. That's the one in the middle of, of Madrid and the one in, uh, in Barcelona. So what might be an interesting scenario to run, so let's go back to that analytics panel. And what I'm trying to give you the sense is that as a scenario analysis tool, the way we do these things is we come, we come and configure a scenario. So I'm going to release those capacity uh, constraints um, uh, right now, and I'm going to run the model, uh, run the model again, and ask it to to violate those capacity constraints. Because what I'm trying to understand here is if I do move volumes about the network and I shut DCs, how much extra volume do I need to push through um, uh, through, through the through the different um, uh, DCs? So let's give that a couple of seconds to to solve. And and I think sorry to interrupt, Paul. Just whilst that's Solving, I think for me the 
the big point here is is the speed of doing this so this is a very interactive process that you're just coming up with different scenarios solving them it's not as we saw from the survey we've come up with a question and it then takes us days or weeks or even months to come back with the answer by which time life has moved on and the question has changed and we we now need to understand something different sorry i'll, right. I'll let you carry right. on thanks thanks for that point all right, so we're back at that resources page and you can see we've relaxed these capacity constraints. And what the model is now telling us, if it could, it would, where you've got a, a DC in Victoria gas days of capacity of 200,000, it's saying, you know, if you could make that 224,000 uh, uh, capacity, which is roughly a 12% increase, you know, we could save ourselves some, some money by reallocating customers to that, that DC. And that maybe becomes a conversation with your, your DC manager to say, uh, you know, is, it, is, is that possible or is it impossible? Is it something really easy to do? Is it going to cost us, uh, cost us CapEx or, or, or money to do? So let's, uh, let's run another scenario where you, where you present this, this, uh, this, this result to your, your business people. And, and I've, I also want to use this scenario to make the, the, the point and emphasize that the maths that, that generates these scenarios is, is beautiful and it's powerful, but it's just, it's just mathematics. So if you put this in front of your logistics manager, he might say to you, he or she might say to you, you know, there's a very good reason that we've got a location in Toledo and Segovia because the metropolitan area is just too, too big to traverse north and south on a daily basis to, you know, to service our, our customers. Uh, so we have to keep those. And there's many other reasons for, for keeping DCs. They might be highly um, invested in, in automation uh, various uh, other reasons. So let's try a scenario where we say, okay, I'm forcing the Segovia DC to stay open and I'm forcing the, the Toledo uh, DC to stay open and I'd like you to now come back with an optimum uh, answer for that. And while this one's uh, uh, turning the wheel over there, so I mean, we mentioned earlier that a lot happens during this, 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 this solve, but I think it's also good to take the time to, to make the point that you know, the, the user interface is, 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 is very simple. We, we've tried to design it that way so that supply chain people can, you know, use this really quickly and get to, get to answers really easily. But the, the maths, when you hit that optimize button, is really, really complex. So, I mean, Ames has spent 30 years plus developing this, this optimize, uh, optimization technology and making it accessible. And all of that uh, power is still built, brought to bear in the browser by, by, a, supply chain, uh, by a supply chain user. So you can see why would we force Segovia and Toledo to stay open? Uh, the model has said, well, if I can't close them, there's no other DC that I would like to uh, I would like to to close. So it's kind of giving us the message if we go to the flow box back here, saying, you know, closing DCs in this in this network is not necessarily uh, you know to, to your advantage. So there's a minimal uh, cost saving by reallocating customers, um, but it's not really saving money by by closing uh, DCs. So let's do let's do uh, one one uh, scenario last scenario in network design where we actually tell the model well I still don't believe you so I actually want you to close one DC in this in this network because I still believe that will save us money so I'm going to make the min and the max uh, the min DC is one the max DC is eight so I'm saying close at least one you need to keep Segovia and Toledo uh, open so but I'm not going to uh, force you to to close any specific one. Let the model decide that. Uh, so let's hit the hit the optimize button while that one solves. And I'm still keeping the other conditions the same. So cap capacity constraints off at the DCs. Lead time constraints have always been on. We'll talk a little bit about that at the at the moment. But let's take a look at what uh, what this one does for us. And, and I guess another scenario potentially you could do is is if you've got say a a, a break point coming up in a lease on one of those DCs, you might want to look at. Well, if I do close it, what's the impact on overall cost? And then you could tick a force close then and then run it and say, yeah, actually, what's the impact on my cost if I, if I choose to take the option on yeah. exiting this particular site? Yeah, yeah, it's a great example where you could use this force close uh, uh, um, flag to, to force certain DCs closed in your, in your solution. So let's take a look at what it's done. We can see if we zoom out a little bit um, and compare it to the base case, what it's done is it's closed this uh, DC over here in the southeast of Spain, Andujar. In the base case, we had a DC here. And uh, what this optimized case is said, well, you forced me to close one, so I'm going to close that Andujar DC over there. 
still serves it as a demand point and the customers uh, distributed around it from the base case, um, I'm going to allocate to the, the, the DCs that are in the surrounding uh, um, areas, so either to the north or to the, to, to, to the, to the south. But what's, what's more interesting is that if you take a look at the end-to-end -end supply chain costs, the costs have actually gone up. So they've gone up from 53 million in the base case to 55 million in the scenario. So I guess that scenario is really confirming to you the fact that closing DCs is not necessarily going to save you uh, money in this, in this supply chain. And that's purely dr uh, driven by the, by the, by the data that, that, we, that we're feeding the model. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, uh, data in a minute. So we mentioned earlier that, that lead time, so lead time is often a critical uh, element in, in, in supply chain. So we've been, uh, we've left that, that lead time constraint uh, uh, on, uh, off, I beg your pardon, in all these uh, scenarios. Um, and the reason we do that is because in the model, we, we, we've set a, a lead time constraint of, of uh, four hours. So we've told the, the, the model, if it respects lead time constraints, it has to be able to service all customers within uh, four hours. Um, and we know that's not possible because if we look at the, at the solve right now, we can see that some customers are taking four to five hours to reach and some customers are taking five to six hours reach. So there's two customers out there on the, out there on the limb. Um, so, but, but what's, what's sometimes more interesting from a lead time point of view is not to, to know that, you know, we've got these constraints and where they'll break, but actually to, to get some insight and, and analytics on, on what my, my lead time looks like and, my, and, and lead time really is, yeah, is a proxy for, for service levels. So the closer you are from a, a drive time point of view, the better your, your, your service levels. So this graph is telling us from a distribution point of view, I can touch 116 of my customers in, in a quarter of an hour. I can reach another 64 and a half, et cetera, et cetera, to one hour. And then a big chunk uh, take me an hour between one and two hours to, to reach. Uh, Etc. Two and three hours, and that's 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 quite insightful from a from a service level point of view, just to understand in these different um, scenarios, you know, what does more or less DCs mean from a, um, a service level point of view. So I want to show you one more thing in in network design, and then we'll turn our attention to to center of gravity, just to get some more insights there. But what I'm going to do here for the last scenario is say, well, what happens if um, if I take if I take that checkbox off? Which is the relaxed lead time, and what happens here is that the 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 the, the model uh, we know it's going to run infeasible, so it's it's because it can't reach those um, the, the, those those customers because they they take longer than four or five hours to do. But what I want to show you is how we highlight which customers those are, um, and that becomes really useful from a from a from an exception management point of view. So a neat little feature here in the software is that if it does run infeasible. Um, it's the model allows you to um, rerun the model, uh, ignoring the feasibility. So I'm going to do that uh, right now, um, and then it resolves, but basically ignores all the the constraints that it that it uh, that it can't meet. And this is a really powerful uh, a tool in terms of running models. So a lot of times when you when you run these models, they run they run infeasible and can can be very difficult to 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 understand why that is. So this is a very neat uh, uh, um, uh, future to ha help help understand why the the, the model's not uh, not solving. But what's more more interesting is in in a moment it will pop out a list of exactly which customers it cannot uh, service due to that lead time constraint of of four hours uh, uh, drive time. And and I think it, I mean this really talks to the that lack of skilled resource being an issue because here as long as you understand the supply chain context and what you're trying to do that's the skill that's required not the optimization and modeling skill that often is the perception that that's what i need and that's why i can't get started with this type of yeah. this type of technology and approach yeah it's a great point Brian. um and then once i got to this point i can so all of these uh, drill down tables in the app i can just uh, download load them into an excel uh, uh, table and that will give me a list of the, the customers that I cannot uh, service due to lead time constraints. And then I can use this as an exception management tool and ask myself, are these important customers? Do I need to make a plan? Do I need to create another facility? Or is it something I can manage with a, with a gentler a, 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 a service level without, without establishing new capacity? All right, so that's a, an example of how you, how you run scenarios in, in, in network design. 
what I want to do is, is look at center of uh, gravity uh, briefly. And this is one of the apps in the network design suite as well. But this kind of answers the question of um, where do I create new capacity? So what are the candidate locations if I want to create new, new DCs, where should, they, where should they be? So it starts off with uh, just mapping out the, out the demand. And what I'm going to do now, I'm going to ask center of gravity to give me a footprint of nine uh, DCs. And the reason I'm asking it for nine is because I want to overlay it on top of my current network and see at a pretty high level and pretty quickly, so not to the nearest uh, meter certainly, but certainly from a re regional point of view, is my network really horrible or is it not, not too bad? So remember, center of gravity creates completely blue sky theoretical um, uh, locations, but it's a great way of uh, very quickly understanding whether your current network is, is reasonable or, or, or pretty wrong. So let's uh, let's do this by let's start off by um, overlaying uh, the center of gravity network over the the current network. Uh, let's just do this. So I've got the the, the base case uh, network on the on the bottom, and what I've done over here in center of gravity is run a nine DC center of gravity. So straight away you can see it's done the same thing. It's closed. It's not interested in creating three um, DCs around the Madrid the Madrid area. So the first thing I need to do is, is fix that. So I'm going to go and fix some locations in here, and I'm going to tell it do that again, but make sure you keep uh, Segovia, make sure you keep Alcobendas, which is the one in the middle of Madrid, and make sure you keep the the Toledo one. So I'm going to go back to the centers of gravity, and this will give me a, a more realistic um, uh, uh, apples for apples comparison of a theoretical blue sky uh, network with nine DCs versus the current one, I, one I've got, you know, taking into account that I need those three in the, in the Madrid area. So let's give that a couple of seconds to solve. All right, so that, that solves. Um, so the first thing I, I notice is that in the northwest of Spain, in my current network, I've got a, um, I've got a DC up here in Dijon, whereas the center of gravity is saying, yeah, maybe that one should be a little bit uh, over to the west in Galicia. And if I look at the south of, of uh, Spain in my current network, there's, there's a DC near Sevilla, where center of gravity is saying, yeah, that's, that's close enough. But actually this DC that you've got in Andujar might be better off from a cost perspective to be on the east coast somewhere near near Murcia. So straight away I've got a view that you know most of my networks okay you know Barcelona, Valencia, Madrid those are all fine but maybe in the north and the south I've got some questions that need answering and I think the next not logical step in this process would be take those as candidate DCs into network design and do a bit more detailed modeling in, 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 in network design. And, and another way to do that would be to say, you know, I've done the network runs that tell me less DCs is not a good thing for me. So actually, I want to go and open three new crosstalks, uh, you know, move from a nine DC uh, footprint to nine DCs plus three crosstalks. So the immediate question is, where should they be? And center of gravity is a great tool to, to, to do that. So what I've done here is run a scenario where I've asked it for 12 locations, and it will now provide these candidate locations, again, to, you know, to, to, to a regionally correct point of view. And then this be probably becomes a conversation with, with real estate people to say, you know, I, I really need a, a, a DC somewhere in the Zaragoza area. Can you please go and, and, and investigate where I can find DC space and what that would cost me? Um, and then you can bring that into network design as a candidate location and do some more, some more detailed modeling. So I want to stop there uh, from, a, from a technology uh, demonstration point of view. Because I think what I've tried to show you is that you know two of those barriers are are, are talking about about the right software um, and the skills of resource. So there's these things: the right tools, the skilled resources, and the, and the time to to value. So if you look at those three things together with technology like this, I think I think it 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 addresses those to to you know to to a large to a large degree. So. We've kept the technology easy to use, so it's, it's using the browser, which pretty much everybody knows how to use. Um, and we use Excel as a, as a mechanism to bring data into the application. That's one of the, 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 the mechanisms. You can also integrate directly, but you know, for, for a quick start point of view and for supply chain professionals, we, we know how to use Excel and we know how to use the browser. So let's use those, those two, two tools. 
uh, really easy to use, not too many screens, um, not too many uh, bells and whistles or complicated functionality that you need to spend weeks getting trained on. So we can typically train up teams to, to be up, you know, using this, this technology in, in, in one day, day, day of training. So you don't need to be a database specialist or an OR specialist or a maths uh, a specialist or a highly trained uh, software specialist ne necessarily to use this technology. Uh, but you're still getting the benefit of those, those powerful souls and the CPLEX uh, solver and the 30 years of, of, of investments in the maths, uh, the maths behind the scenes. <clears throat> I'd like to turn to the, to the other major um, barrier, and that's that's data. So, as Brian says, often this can be be a perception, uh, and when you start this this project, uh, you know, often a trap is to is to say, well, you know, I need an end-to-end -end encyclopedia full of data before I can start, um, and you launch a six-month IT project before you've even seen your first uh, uh, screen. So we take a very different uh, view on that, and it's, and it's an approach uh, view that says start with what you've got um, and start quickly so that you can start seeing the, 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 the screens and getting the insights. And then as you go, you'll figure out where you need to sharpen the pencil on what, on what data, you, data you need. So what I'm actually going to do is just take you through some of the, the data that was used to populate the, the, the demo that you've just seen and talk through some of the potential uh, uh, um, uh, methodologies you can use to not uh, um, stop yourself from getting started due to lack of, of data. So first of all, we've chosen you know, high level product groups. So I think from a, from a product grouping point of view, no, no need to start modeling at the SKU level. You're just trying to understand uh, 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 major flows. And another point on this would be to say, well, let's just start on the outbound from DC to customer because we really need to understand that echelon uh, we don't need to model all the way back to supplier and figure out where our suppliers are in primary. We can do that later, absolutely. But let's start off with a, with, with with something we can we you know that we want to see and that can add value. So that's from a a a, a product point of view, and then necessarily you do need some some demand data to 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 drive your your your, your model. And typically, the way clients or customers do this is is to is to use last year's demand as a as a proxy for future uh, uh, demand. So uh, ask your ER people to, to extract last year's data per, per demand per customer um, and use that as a starting point. But even if you cannot do that, even if you're too impatient to wait for that, what we've done for this demo, actually because it's a, a retail supply chain, we just use uh, a population as a proxy for demand. And that sounds like a pretty crude assumption, but um, actually it will get you some way to understanding regionally where your big demand is. Um, it's also great for when you want to model competitor supply chains and you don't really know what you know where their customers are. Um, but yeah, so what I've done here is just taken every every town in Spain, used their population and multiplied that out by a total demand number to get a, a, a proxy for demand. So I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that this is not necessarily the 100% correct way to do to do things, but it is a fairly creative shortcut to get you to a point where you're actually visualizing the flows. Uh, in your supply chain network, and what we spoke about earlier was that you know visualization and actually just being able to see what's going on um, is a big is a big part of that. So location data. So because we're using Townsio is really easy. There's plenty of free databases of geocodes um, out there, which you can geocode in the middle of a town, and that's another great shortcut for network design. So don't get too caught up on on in the exact street address and you know geocoding customers to the nearest meter. Uh, very often, geocoding at the suburb or town level is, is plenty detailed enough for, for network design. Of course, later on, if you want to do, do that, with, you know, there, there's tools to do that. You can do that with Google Maps and OpenStreetMaps as, as, as well. Um, and that brings us straight to the road distances question. So again, you, you, might, you might be afraid to start because you, 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 don't, want, you don't have actual road distances. Uh, start with straight lines. Uh, um, it's a very good good approximation in the network design scheme of things uh, to start understanding how your supply chain looks and getting those first scenarios in. And later on, before you spend the capex and before you invest in your final scenario, then go and generate some actual road distances. But uh, no reason not to start with with um, uh, uh, straight lines. You need to know a little bit about uh, capacity. So so at your DCs. Again, you could spend a long time, you know, at each of your DCs trying to understand what the exact uh, capacity is, 
Uh, another way to do that is to say, well, let's just ask our DC or look at our ERP from last year and say, what did you do last year? And use that as your initial marker in the model for, for what the capacity per DC is. Um, and then as we did in the scenarios, it's more a question of, it's not a question of exactly what's the nameplate capacity of that racking in that DC. It's more a conversation about, do I need to increase that by 50% or 10% or is that really difficult? Do I need to spend CapEx to do that or is it something I can, can do by adding a few hours of uh, uh, overtime. And then the last one that's that's always intimidating is transport costs. And, and I think, again, in your final scenarios and when, you, when you're forcing a base case, this, this sheet might have tens of thousands of rows where you model uh, courier rate cards down to the nth degree. But actually with the demo that you've seen, I, I model transport with one line of data. Um, and again, this is an assumption to get Teta started. So what this line says is I've created a group called DCs and a group called demand cities. So the app automatically creates a lane between every DC and every demand city at a transport cost of 0.2, so it's 20 euro cents per, uh, per stem kilometer away from the DC. And again, that's, that might be a benchmark number that you've got in your organization or that's, that's out there. And it might be an approximation, but you apply that as a blanket rate to your network and you can very quickly start seeing whether your network is, is really in the wrong place. What are the, the, the big levers to, to pull to start optimizing that? And that will give you the, the, the directions in terms of sharpening up your data requirement. So that was quite a long story, but I think the, the, the bottom line there is, you know, get to a point where, you, where you're delivering this kind of screen and this kind of analysis uh, in terms of cost savings. And then that becomes a very different conversation with, with your boss in terms of that, that management uh, buy-in that we, that we spoke about. So if you can show maps of your supply chain and you can say, you know, I think there's 10% there's saving in end-to-end -end supply chain costs, uh, that's a very different conversation than saying, you know what, we need technology, but I'm not sure how much value it's, it's going to deliver. So I'm going to stop there. I'm looking at the at the at the clock as well, but uh, I hope that gives some sense of of how, of how the technology and how you use it can address some of those uh, barriers that we spoke about earlier. All right. Thank you, Paul and Brian. And we will now go ahead and take some time for questions. Let me go to the list and start with a question from Jamie. Uh, do you work with many LSPs, logistic server providers? Or are your customers usually manufacturers? Actually, yeah, we work we work with both. So, um, in terms of LSPs, three PLs, whatever you want to however you want to describe them. Um, so, so typical use cases for some of those guys is evaluating new customers that they want to onboard. So, what impact is that going to have uh, on my network? Uh, and and or it's it's a fairly acquisition intensive industry as well so if if one 3pl is looking at acquiring another one or, or moving into a different space and there's two distribution networks coming together um what what's the impact there which are the sites that should be retained which ones are no longer required um so yeah bit of, bit of a long answer but the simple answer is is yes we work um we work across the full spectrum very good. Then we move to a question from Giovanni. How can blockchain tackle some of these challenges, especially regarding data quality and data sharing? The role of the role of blockchain in this. So, so I guess if you were if you were modeling um, across an extended enterprise, so not just within your organization, but back into your suppliers and potentially your suppliers suppliers and then your customers and your customers customers then in terms of the transmission and, and stewardship and, and security of the data between all of those then and i guess blockchain could have a a role to play in that um, and then it being you know it being used centrally in some sort of planning tool um, by cars but i do think maybe just to add to that i do think blockchain finds its niche a little bit lower down in the planning hierarchy. So from a from a strategic point of view, whether you're trying to see the broad brush strokes, you know, blockchain might be much more useful in the transactional level where you're tracking individual shipments on, on individual vehicles and trying to, you know, optimize that in, in real time. Um, 
uh, you know, there's probably more more application at, at the more granular levels of planning than, than up here at, at the strategic level. That would be my, my, my view on it. All right. Uh, Mark asks, is it possible to model individual restrictions? So is it possible to adjust the mathematical model that bases on the network design? Yeah, absolutely. So that's one of the, the 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 strengths of the of the network design app. So everything you saw in the demo is driven by the data that I showed you in the spreadsheets, and that's that's completely under under your control. So you can model um, uh, chocolate biscuits in Peru, or you can model spare parts in China uh, using generic concepts of network modeling and the data the data that you drive into the application. You, you basically build your 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 view your supply chain out of the data that you push in there, and then there's many opportunities to model uh, different elements of that. So so a lot of the the constraints are at the product level, uh, or at the product location level, or or at both, or at at at, at um, uh, either one. So through the the, the data um, entry mechanism, there's lots of uh, scope to model the particular you know the particularities of your of your your supply chain. All right, so we'll move to the next question from Thomas. Do I need to have a license for Ames Pro in order to access the SE Navigator, or is the demo also available for, quote, normal developers? It's an interesting question, yeah. So in terms of, 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 of our view on it at the moment is that, um, you know, the AC Navigator applications and the bespoke applications that, that customers have been building for a long time uh, fit beautifully to, uh, beautifully to, 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 together. So there's there's no reasons why, why clients can't be uh, using uh, the kind of generic app that you've just seen in this demo um, on the same platform as a very bespoke uh, uh, line scheduling application that, they, that, they, that they've built themselves. So conceptually, it's actually something we like very much because it, if, if you get to a point where both of those applications, network design and detailed production scheduling, are leveraging a common data source, a kind of digital twin of your, your supply chain, uh, we see that as a really uh, a, a really powerful way to, way to move. So I, th I think technically, yes, um, I, th I think that would be the short answer there. All right, and then I'm afraid we'll have to move to the last question um, for now. Uh, it's a question from Mauna. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. How to visualize data of products that are common between many sites? I'm not sure if I understand the 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 question 100% correctly, but. So the approach we've taken with with network design, and this would be advice from a, a general network design modeling point of view, is to is to use product groups rather than individual uh, uh, products. So if I'm understanding the question correctly, you know, what, how do I how do I differentiate between uh, you know boxes of tomatoes and boxes of oranges? So in the way we've modeled that demo, we we modeled food products. Um, so that that kind of becomes a, a little bit invisible. But if you've got a really good reason to to model the differences between oranges and tomatoes, so typically if you've got different suppliers for different products or they move in different modes of transport, for example, uh, if you've got a good reason to model those those as different product groups, then you then you then you then you just do that. So, so typically you want to be somewhere between two two and I would, you know, I would recommend not much more than 20, 30, 50 at a, at a max product groups, um, and does does uh, um, take some thought in terms of, of what product groups you select for the for network mo modeling and there may not be product groups that are already established in your ERP necessarily there's 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 reasons for um, you have to have a very good reason for creating a, a modeling a product group um, but that's all possible so once you've gone through through that you can you can model any products you you, you like if you need to see that that visibility for that product I hope that that answers the question all right, then, um, yeah, there are some more uh, questions coming in from Thales, Xiaoming, Brent, and, and Thomas. Um, I made a note of all your questions, so uh, I wanna also want to respect everybody's time that they reserved for today. So we'll get back to you over our email uh, right after this webinar. And, um, yeah, then I'm afraid we have to wrap up. Uh, thanks, everyone, and we appreciate you being here today.
we'll be sending out a link to the video within the next week, the recording of the slides and the voiceover of Paul and Brian. And um, in the meantime, you can check some new posts on our AIM Supply Chain blog. And if you still have any questions for us or uh, want to talk to us, please feel free to reach out. Yeah, thanks again for joining us today and hope to see you next time.